Thank you for joining us online at Path Point Fellowship Church, where we're all about bringing God and people together. If you're in the Amarillo area, we'd love you to join us Sunday mornings at 1030. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so by going to pathpointfellowship.com slash giving. We hope that you enjoy today's message and pray that it's relevant and impacts your life. I want you to, uh, we don't normally do this here at Path Point. But just, I want you to look over at the person sitting next to you and just say to them, I see the love of God on you. Amen. To all those that are in the coffee bar, in the coffee bar atrium, in the North Auditorium, whether you're listening to us on uh, um, any of our technology that, we, that you might have, if you're watching us by video, listening to us on CD, uh, We just want you to know that you're highly favored and blessed by God. The greater days, your best days are ahead of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. You know, I want to begin a series this morning, and I want to remind you of uh, the series that we just came out of called Ghost. How many of you you were here during that series, Ghost? How many of you learned anything during that series? What we talked about in that previous series series is we removed the mysticism of this controversial figure that is surrounded by, in, um, in the Scripture, the Holy Ghost. We saw that he's not an it. He is not a blob of power. He's not a shapeless force, but he's a person. The Holy Ghost is a person. And until you see him as a person, he cannot become personal with you. Amen? We saw that Jesus making these uh, descriptions of him. He called him an advocate. He called him a comforter, a counselor. He called him the spirit of truth. He called him a guide. But we focus primarily on this label that Jesus gave him, and that is the helper. The Holy Ghost is the helper. In that series, we also discovered you can't have a personal relationship with someone through someone else. And so the Holy Spirit wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to have a personal relationship with every single person in this room, every single person in the church, every single person in the body of Christ. Now, you or I might have decided that we don't want to have a personal relationship with him because something somebody said or because of we come from a denomination where they, where they avoided any kind of language that relates to the Holy Ghost or maybe they actually uh, preached against it. You know, those people over there at that church, they received the Holy Ghost. They believe in the Holy Ghost and they're weird. And I told you during this series, I've been in both camps, and they're weird on both sides. <laughs> Just because you have the Holy Ghost doesn't make you weird. They were weird before they had the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen? So he wants to have a personal relationship with you. Now, whether you've decided to have a personal relationship with him or not, it hasn't changed God's mind. It was God that sent the Holy Spirit to be your helper. So many people, Christians, are crying out, God, help me. Jesus, help me. And never even consider the Holy Spirit has been sent by God to earth to come alongside you to be your helper. You ought to actually be talking to the Holy Ghost. God didn't change his mind. Amen? Now, we showed you what kind of helper was. Uh, Romans, the 8th chapter tells us that you don't even know what to pray, even as a Christian. Verse 28 says, you don't know what to pray. Now, you may know how to pray because you know uh, how the Bible describes prayer, but you don't know what to pray for in that specific season in your life or that specific area of your life without the Holy Ghost. We spent a whole session on just that. Today, I want us to, to jump off Go a little further here, and I want us to look at how Jesus responded to the Holy Ghost. And I want to do that in a series that I want to title The Game Changer. The Game Changer. 
In John the 14th chapter, verse 16, Jesus made this statement. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So everything you've been told about uh, healings, miracles, signs, and wonders, that it passed away with the apostles, no, it didn't because the Holy Spirit is the one who brought those signs, wonders, and miracles. And he says what? That he will abide with you how, how long? Is there an expiration date? No, it's forever. He'll abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, speaking of the helper, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Let me pause right there. You can't have something you don't see. You can't see. You can't have something that you you don't know. You can only have it because you see it. You can only receive it because you know it. But then he turned around and said, but you know him. For he dwells with you. And let me paraphrase this next part. And one day he will be in you. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to help us open our eyes that we may see clearly, precisely, and accurately. I ask you to speak through my lips, think through my mind, that I only say those things which you tell me to say, only do those things that you show me to do. And then, Father, that we walk away from this session this morning having a good time having laughter having fun with one another building relationship with each other but primarily father we walk away building a personal relationship with the holy ghost we thank you for these things in jesus name amen now i want to pay particular attention to that last phrase he dwells with you and one day he will be in you I want to ask a, a stupid question. It's, this is really stupid. Was Jesus afraid of the Holy Ghost? Did he avoid the Holy Ghost? Did he ignore the Holy Ghost? Or did Jesus accept and receive the Holy Spirit? Now, I want us to look at uh, something that actually Pastor Joe referred to. This is the first encounter that we see that Jesus has with the Holy Ghost in the third chapter of Luke. So let's read this. We know that that Jesus goes to the Jordan River where John the Baptist is baptizing in water people. And it says this, when all the people were baptized, it it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. It's just like Jesus to go last. He waited until everybody else was baptized before he got baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said you are my beloved son and you I'm well pleased you see that he said the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him now notice let me show you what Jesus didn't do oh no here's the Holy Ghost I don't want to have anything to do with him he wasn't afraid of him since when look at that in the form of a dove since when are you afraid of a dove He didn't come down in the form of a gun or the form of a bomb. He came down in a bodily form, in a physical form of a dove, which is symbolic of what? Peace. But he's been so controversial, not just in the world. He's been controversial in the church because the devil's lied and tried to make us afraid of him because what will happen when the Holy Ghost comes upon us? What will happen? Now, in just a few verses further, Luke 4, verse 1, it says this, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Then Jesus, being filled. So uh, grab hold of that phrase because it goes from uh, the Holy Ghost coming up on him to the Holy Ghost coming in him. There's a difference between him coming up on you and him coming in you. Only when he came up on him, then he came in him, could he lead him. Only when the Holy Ghost comes up on you and then comes in you, can he lead you. Notice the process. Notice the process. Now, because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna connect to that process throughout Scripture today. 
upon you in you. There's a difference between me having something on and it and me having something in me. It's only when it becomes when it gets in me that it becomes a part of who I am. That's the way it is with the Holy Ghost. When you got saved, he came up on you, but it takes an invitation from you to invite him in. Amen? Now, the, the, the phrase is, in fact, Pastor Keith has this, this bracelet that he wears. It's WWJD. What would Jesus do? You remember when that was a fad and Christians were wearing WWJD? And so, <laughs> what would Jesus do? You know, the Christians ask this all the time. Uh, all around the world, Christians will say, Lord, what would you do in this situation? Lord, I, I'm asking you to help me see uh, what decision or choice I should make about this. And rightfully so. That's the filter that we should live through and live with as believers. We should ask him, what should we do? Well, not only is this what Jesus would do, it's what he did. And you want to be like who? Not like Mike. You want to be like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus, right? Now, that's what happened. Now, those events happened right there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So let's roll forward over three years into his ministry. He is at the end of his earthly ministry. And Jesus has died on the cross. He's gone to the grave, gone to hell. In three days, he's resurrected. And for the next 40 days, he's going to appear off and on to his disciples, giving them instructions. One of those instru instructions is found in Matthew, the 28th, uh, 28th chapter. We know it as the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, many people believe, many Christians believe, that this was the last instruction that Jesus gave his disciples. It's not. It's not. The last instruction Jesus gave his disciples was not go. It was wait. How I many you know there's a difference between go and wait? In the 24th chapter of Luke, notice what it says. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry, that's another word for wait, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Behold, I send the promise of my Father. Notice that, upon you. Behold, I send the promise upon you. Behold, I'm going to send the promise upon you. That word promise is there, there is not referring to a what. It's not referring to an it. It's referring to a person. It's not referring to power. It's referring to a person. Behold, I send the promise upon you. And when he comes up on you, you're going to be endued with power from on high. Do you get what I said? Now, <laughs> you see why the enemy wants to keep you from receiving the person, and he's worked really hard at it because he realizes there's a correlation between the person and the power. I, 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 you know, uh, I've been a Christian now for 50 years. Uh, I, I so want people, the, the body of Christ, understand that the Holy Ghost connects us to the Father and Son. The Holy Ghost connects us to the Father and Son. Now, in reading everything that we've said today, all these scriptures, what, what do we see? We see that Jesus received the Holy Ghost. Well, then, let me ask you this question. Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? If Jesus received the Holy Ghost, shouldn't we? Instead of being afraid of him, instead of him being a controversial figure, instead of ignoring him or avoiding him or uh, acting as if, even in our Christian journey and Christian experience, acting as if he doesn't even exist because we've struck him from our language. It's important to embrace uh, the Holy Ghost, for a lack of a better term, is a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life even though he would love to be present and personal with you. Amen? Um, <laughs> look at that. Endued with power from on high. Endued with power from on high. Now, um, I want us to skip past the upper room experience. And I want us to move forward in time 
into Acts, the second chapter, where Peter has had this, um, he's had this, uh, he's been preaching to a group of people, and while he's preaching to this group of people, all of a sudden there's a supernatural a manifestation. There's a demonstration of power from the Holy Ghost. And so the people there say this, and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So let's answer that question. What shall we do when we see when, when, when we see a, a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, a demonstration of power, one of the reasons that the Holy Ghost doesn't demonstrate in power the way he would like to is because he's not here to promote fear and confusion. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. In fact, when, when I was a kid, I was nine years old, my dad took his first uh, position as a pastor in a little community, and um, I don't know, maybe that, maybe that community had twelve or 15,000 people in it. <clears throat> a couple years later, we moved to another town. He took another pastoral position in a community. Maybe there was 20,000 people in that community. It didn't matter where we went. It was always the same. Two camps of churches. One camp that received the Holy Ghost, and so the Holy Ghost was in their language. And then the other camp that didn't receive the Holy Ghost in in the way that we're talking about today, that the Holy Ghost just wasn't mentioned. It just wasn't anything they talked about. They saw the Trinity as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible instead of God the Holy Ghost. So... Um, I noticed that 15 years ago I was driving and, and taking my boys to school 15 years ago our boys were in school isn't that amazing and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> over the next few days when I was taking them to school I was noticing different churches in this community Amarillo that was having uh, they, were, they were building they were building onto their facilities or they were building a new sanctuary or something like that and all of a sudden, I noticed uh, day after day, the Holy Spirit would point that out to me. It just stuck out like a sore thumb. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And finally, one day, I was praying. The Lord said, uh, I want you to, to send those three churches a check for their building program. Now, those three churches were three different denominations. So I sent them, I sent them a check. Each one of them, the same amount. Over the next few days, I got thank you cards. Except from one church, I got his administrator who showed up at our door of our office and said, we cannot take your check. Now, I don't know about you, but my money's good. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) If somebody's going to send me a check, I'm going to put it into the building fund if that's what... in, in other words, in other words, uh, there was, had been something said about me and my church. Now, when I'm going through that, I didn't say, I'm not saying this to, to, uh, to be negative about churches, be negative about people. I'm saying this because what happened is the Lord began to talk to me and the Holy Spirit began to talk to me about that situation. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me one day. He said, The body of Christ, the church, has used me as a tool of division for years. And he said, and I literally saw him on the inside of of me. He did this, and I've had nothing to do with it. He said, I've literally been sent from heaven to earth to be the helper of the church. And instead of allowing me to be the helper, I have become the controversial figure that has divided the church, and I've had nothing that I've been misrepresented. And a few days later, Jesus showed up in my prayer chamber. And he said this to me about that because I was, I was dealing, I was trying, th- 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 I do everything I can to keep my soul clean, to not get offended because the best gift I can give you is a healthy me. If I'm not healthy... How can I help you? 
I live my life to stay healthy because a broke person can't help a broke person. So I live that way. That's why I didn't have a donut this morning. I wanted one. That kid was eating that cherry donut. And man, I was like, let me see. Look at that kid. It's just dripping down his face. I'm just like, oh, man, give me a donut. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I actually, we actually broke a rule the other day in our house. And it, it was probably nine or ten months since we had a pizza. We ordered a pizza. I said, no, order my own. I don't, I'm not sharing with you. <laughs> You get yours, I'll get mine, okay? I sat there and hate the whole pie, buddy. I'm going to tell you, it was good. It'll be another year before I have pizza, but, man, it was good. Now, so I had, the, I had Jesus say this to me about that. He said, the same religious spirit that rejected me at Bethlehem, that rejected me at Nazareth, that rejected me in Israel, is the same religious spirit that's rejecting the Holy Ghost, and he has been doing it for generations. It's the same religious spirit. They hadn't gone anywhere. They're still here, like forever. Amen? Now, so what, did, what, what, what are we going to do, they asked Peter. And Peter says this, he responds to them in verse 38, verse 39. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise, there's that word again, the promise is a person and only when you receive the person can you receive the power. Amen? For the promise is to you and to your children. We could say to your children's children, to your children's children's children, to your children's children's children, because he says, and to all those who are afar off in time, as many as our God shall call. So the Holy Ghost wasn't just for them. It wasn't just for the apostles. It was for you. Say, the Holy Ghost is for me. Okay? Okay? Now, there are three things, three simple steps that Peter gives us in these two scriptures. Three simple steps, and they're, they're in your insert. Number one, repent. Number two, be water baptized. And number three, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter's telling us there are two additional steps beyond salvation. I want you to grab hold of this. So not only did he instruct them, he instructs us that there are two steps beyond salvation. This is, the, this is the roadmap for every Christ follower. And to not stop at, you know, the first step. Or to stop at the first and, or second step. But to follow through with it. Because what the third step produces is a path of power. A path of life. It's a game changer. For those of you who don't know this, it's a game changer. It changes everything. Amen? So, so I want you to, to, to see this this morning, how significant this is. This isn't, this, you know, um, I, I, I'd like to say it this way. This, once you're a Christian, this is the most important decision you will ever make. And that is to have a personal relationship with the Holy Ghost important now we see these three simple steps now I want us to look at something John said in first John the fifth chapter because he shows us three baptisms he says for there are three that bear witness in heaven the father the word and the Holy Spirit now when he's referring here to the word he's actually referencing Jesus because in John, the book of John, the first chapter, remember it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made, in him was life, the light was the light of men, the light shined. Anyway, all the way down to verse 12, he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among men, the only begotten son of the living God, referring to Jesus. Here he is, referring to Jesus. He said, there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, God, 
Jesus, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? One. I just don't think Missy would like having two-thirds of me. She wants all of me. All of me. Come on. She wants all of me. God wants you to want all of him, all that he has to offer, all of his promises. The reason some Christians live without some of the, 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 the without realizing some of the promises of God is because they hadn't accepted the whole part of the Trinity. Amen? And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Could I, could I present to you today that there are three baptisms? Just like there are three simple steps that Peter gives us, there are three baptisms. Let me ask you this. Have you, have you been baptized in one of them? Just one of them? Have you been baptized in two of them? Or have you been baptized in all three of them? Amen? Now, I'm saying this today to tell you that we're at a point in our journey where it's time for you to take the third step. If you haven't taken that third step yet, it's time for you to do that very thing. Amen. Go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. The first thing I want us to do this morning is I want to give you the opportunity because I know by the Spirit there are several people here that you're not saved or that you have a broken relationship with God. And it's time for you to step into that relationship. In other words, step into that first baptism. Be baptized through repentance. And so I'm going to have Pastor Keith lead you in a prayer. So go ahead, Pastor Keith. Well, that's you today with your every head bowed, every eye closed. <clears throat> if you want to accept Jesus, like Pastor Scott said, or you want to rededicate your life, accept him for the first time or rededicate, I want to give you that opportunity right now. And i just like everyone just to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he died on a cross. For my sin. For my sin. And he rose again. And he rose again. I accept him into my life. I accept him into my life. I believe in him. I believe in him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, if you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you made a decision to follow him for the first time or rededicate your life to him today, would you slip up your hand nice and tall? Anybody like that in here in this place? Raise your hand nice. Hi, good. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that other hand. Anybody else? You can put your hand down. Okay, now while we're in this place, your next step is to get baptized in water. How many of you, you know that just through this teaching today, that's the next step you need to take is being baptized in water? Raise your hand if that's you, okay? Look at these hands all over this room. I see that. I see those hands. Okay, you can put your hands down. All right. Now, For those of you who have, the, have uh, taken those first two steps, it's time for you to take the third step. If you're comfortable in doing this, and this is simply you receiving the Holy Ghost. You say, well, Scott, how do you receive or accept the Holy Ghost? The same way you accepted Jesus. It's the same way. And so I want you to just pray this prayer along with me. Just say, in Jesus' name, I receive my helper, my advocate, my counselor, my comforter, the one Jesus called the Spirit of Truth. I receive him into my heart today, upon my life. I receive all of his benefits, all of his power, all of his giftings. I receive everything 
that God has promised me in this relationship with the Holy Ghost. I thank you for provision, for giving to me this gift. I receive it by faith. Him, the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name. Amen.